visionary thinkers discuss the importance of mindfulness in the racially unjust world. Social activist Angela Davis and mindfulness meditation leader John Kabat-Zinn come together in conversation with national focus on police brutality against black men. This event takes place at the Scottish Rite Temple, 1547 Lakeside Drive in Oakland. For details, call 510-393-6119. The community calendar is produced by members of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. Send your listings at least three weeks in advance to KPFA Box 51-1929 Martin Luther King Jr. Way in Berkeley, California, 94704, or email us at calendar at kpfa.org. Tell us if your event is wheelchair accessible. To hear this calendar again, call 510-848-6767, extension 621. This calendar is also online at kpfa.org. That's right, and this is KPFA in Berkeley, 94.1. Also 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFC up in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. Dot O-R-G. It's 7.01. Stay tuned now for Full Circle. Full Circle, yes, we roll the face. 360 degrees, high, high, 360 degrees, high, high, 306, 306, 360 degrees, high, high. Welcome to Full Circle, your cultural affairs radio magazine, produced by apprentices of the First Voice Media Action Program. Last Thursday, to commemorate Oscar Grant's life, the members of the Oscar Grant Foundation held a rally on January 1st to honor Grant's life and to get the word out about lives being lost to police killing. So, on tonight's show, we'll be hearing the voices of some of the attendings of the Oscar Grant Rally. We have the voices of women. We have thoughts from Minister Keith Muhammad. We'll hear from Oakland City Councilwoman Lynette gibson Malcohaney, an interview with Cephas Johnson, also known as Uncle Bobby, he's Oscar Grant's uncle, and youth who are in attendance. Welcome to Full Circle. Today's show is dedicated to Oscar Grant, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, Andy Lopez, Alex Nieto, Eric Gardner, Antonio Martin, Mike Brown, and all those killed at the hands of police. It would almost be impossible to list them all. This past January 1st marked the sixth anniversary of Oscar Grant's murder by BART police at the Oakland Fruitvale BART station. Sadly, deadly force is still being used to kill black men and boys before they have had any chance for due process. Protests are happening all around the country, particularly in the Bay Area where protesters are making it loud and clear that black lives matter. It appears that in the wake of these protests, there have been incidents of white retaliation. Just a few days ago, in an act of domestic terrorism, there was the bombing of the NAACP offices in Colorado Spring, Colorado, making events like the Oscar Grant rally paramount to addressing the racism that is alive and well around the country. Tonight, we are proud to bring you some of the voices among the many people who turned up on January 1st to commemorate the life of Oscar Grant and the movement for justice and police accountability. My fellow apprentices, Vilma V. and Junior Jackson, were the hosts at Oscar Grant's rally. Women were in full attendance. They are the mothers, aunts, sisters, wives, and friends of the fallen sons, nephews, brothers, husbands, and friends. Let's take a listen to some of the powerful women who spoke at the rally. Here, let me uh, do the Duenas family. Christina, I mean, who's a diehard soldier <laughs> for Ernest. Um, here's their family. Really quick, I let my aunt speak for a second, but um, I just want to say that we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Oscar Grant and for the Oakland community and building a base for us to 
the other families for us to work on. So we owe all of you uh, a debt that we can never repay and to Uncle Bobby and to Oscar's family. They're the ones out there gathering the families. They're the ones doing the work. I can tell you that it hurts bad, like Uncle Bobby saying, to have to see so many families every single day, no matter how hard we work. So we just need to keep on doing it because we're building uh, justice. We can see that happening in our streets. We can see it happening in our country, and we just can't stop. So thank you, Oakland. Thank you to Oscar Grant's family. Thank you. I'm Rosemary Duenas, and this is our family. My son, Ernest Duenas, was killed in 2011 by police officer John Moody and I want to thank Oscar Grant's family, Uncle Bobby, Sister Beatrice, Sister Wanda, all of you for standing up and supporting all, everyone. You go from one side of the United States to the other in just days and we appreciate that. God bless you. Thank you. I'm here. Uh, my, my ex-husband and the father of my daughter was shot and killed by the police right in front of his house. He's a white guy. It was 3 p.m. in the afternoon in Napa. So for all the people out there that, that think this is not coming their way, this is out of control. That police officer not only didn't get fired, he got promoted. He's on the SWAT team now. This has to end. End. These people should not be armed. <laughs> Racist Richard Posha. My husband's name was Richard Posha, my ex husband and best friend and ex husband. The Mario Romero family. Hi, my name is Cindy. Um I'm the sister of Mario Romero. My family is here. Uh, my brother Mario was murdered by Vallejo police who shot at him over forty times in front of his house. He was unarmed, he wasn't wor he wasn't wanted. They attacked him. And they shot him at over shot at, at him over 40 times. The officer who murdered my brother he killed three people in 2012, all within a five month period. His name is Sean Kenny. He wasn't fired. He wasn't prosecuted, nor was he investigated. He was promoted. He was promoted to detective. The Vallejo Police Department has attacked us for standing up. When we came out, we came out saying murder because that's what happened. There was no question it was murder. When they planted a police issue training weapon inside of his car and pretended that he pointed it at them, it was murder. Planned murder, premeditated murder. These officers are not drug tested after, they're been, after they've been hired. A lot of people don't know that. They think that all of their officers in their communities are drug tested. No, they're not not beyond hire, and they're not psychologically evaluated. So it's important for you to know that we have terrorists that are terrorizing us. This is terror terrorism on U.S. soil, you know, and we need to call it what it is, okay? We need to stand up. We need to fight because we've been fighting since day one, and we're looking to connect with everybody that's been victims of police brutality. We'd like to get your contact information. We're on, uh, you can look us up on Facebook, Justice for Mario Romero, slash Facebook, and Justice for Mario Romero, Justice for Mario Romero dot com. So uh, we thank you guys. We thank the family of Oscar, Oscar Grant, Sister Beatrice, Uncle Bobby. We love you guys. Wanda, thank you guys. Thank you, Uncle Bobby. God bless you all. I just want to give honor to the Almighty Creator, who without him, we would not be here today. Who gives the families, all of us, support to fight? I thank all the families for coming together. Because united we stand, divided we fall. And they think that this is a joke. They do laugh at us. They act like that what we do are doing out here in the streets is going to go away. But we're not going away. We're going to jab all the way to Congress. We're about to change some bills. We're coming out with the Allen bill. And any police officer that turns off their camera while on duty will be prosecuted, will be fired, will be ran the hell out of town because we're sick and tired of being sick and tired of loved ones losing our, it's just genocide on our youth. And while youth are tired, I'm tired, I'm old now. My life is, is broken without my Allen.
You know, they're mad because we're taking over the BART stations. We are tired. We're going to take over some more BART stations, and we're going to continue to march, and we're going to continue to use our voice, because if we don't, they're just going to go away, close their doors, and act as if this is just another march and another demonstration, but it's not. It's a revolution. Those were some of the powerful women voices from the Oscar Grant rally. It was good to see that they were out in full force to speak up for male life. Let's now hear from the minister Keith Muhammad from the Nation of Islam. He talks about Oscar Grant organizing for police accountability and the DNA of the American police force. We are broadcasting from Fruitvale Station at the BART Plaza. This is the sixth anniversary of the murder of Oscar Grant, who was killed by BART officer Johannes Merjali. And we are now speaking with Keith Mohammed from the Nation of Islam. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Your group played an instrumental role in organizing and getting people together during the period after Oscar Grant was murdered. So can you talk a little bit about those efforts and where you feel the police accountability movement for justice is now? Well, let me just say as a principle of our faith, we want justice. We want equal justice under the law. We want justice applied equally to all, regardless of creed or class or color. So when Oscar was murdered and when Derek Jones was murdered, and when Kenneth Harding was murdered, and when Mario Romero was murdered, and when Ernesto Duenas was murdered, and when Andy Lopez was murdered, and when the many unnamed, unknown persons have been murdered by whatever source or force, we want justice. The Constitution says that the law should apply equally to all. Equal justice under the law is what's declared in the amendments to the Constitution. Yet unfortunately, when our people have suffered, there's been very little equal response. This is why as we declare Black Lives Matter, we're also saying in that, that we're willing to stand up and in the gap where there has not been justice served to make sure that justice is rendered properly. When Oscar was murdered, we didn't know him. We happened to have a justice gathering of black and brown men at Olivet Institutional Baptist Church on January the 3rd of 2009. The news of Oscar's demise was just reaching the public, and I believe the video was released that evening after we left our town hall meeting for men who were already gathered because of unjust incarceration rates, who were already gathered because of the economic conditions that our people face, that were already gathered because of poor educational services that's rendered for black and brown men. When we learned that Oscar had been murdered on videotape, then we didn't allow what happened with Rodney King to happen in Oakland. In other words, we would not allow the media to spin Oscar's life out of control as they've done with Mike Brown. There was no justification for the murder of Mike Brown and there was no justification for the murder of Oscar Grant. So we stood with faith leaders, political leaders, and activists combined from every walk of life and met weekly at Olivet Institutional Baptist Church to demand justice. And on that note, I want to give public condolence to the family of the Reverend Gordon Humphreys, the pastor of Olivet, who passed away uh, just a few weeks ago in Chicago. But he opened up the home and door of Olivet Church to give the justice movement room to organize. We live in a land whose government has hated the rise of its black and brown and poor people to the degree that the FBI's first hired black agent was hired to infiltrate and destroy the movement of Marcus Garvey. That's just a fact in history. Then, as Dr. King and others rose up to demand civil rights, the FBI called Dr. King the greatest enemy to American security. And then in Oakland, when the Panther Party organized against police brutality, they were also declared to be the greatest enemy to the internal uh, structure of the United States of America. So the government has worked against our organizing 
So whenever we organize, we should expect government intervention. It was seen a few weeks ago in Oakland as protesters stood against what happened to Mike Brown and against what happened to our brother in New York. Undercover cops drew weapons at protesters in the streets of Oakland and Berkeley. Well, what are they doing there undercover? Why be undercover? If you're trying to keep people safe from bad traffic, are you trying to keep people away from busting windows? You don't have to be undercover to do that. In fact, your uniform is a greater deterrent than an undercover cop. So when we are looking at a movement among people, we should always anticipate disruptions. And that is the voice of Minister Keith Muhammad from the Nation of Islam, who's talking to us today on the 60-year anniversary of the murder of Oscar Grant. How do you see 2015 happening? Do you see the movement for justice growing? Do you see public perception changing? As long as there is injustice, there will be people who stand for justice. It doesn't matter what state you're in, what city you're in, or what color you are. Whenever there is injustice, there will be people who stand and organize against it. And I will say this, what we are seeing across the country is that the people have grown tired of having to answer continued abuses from law enforcement. To those that are in political office, keep in mind that to many young men and women on the street, they know politics through the police. They don't know the mayor. They don't know the city council. They know the police officers. So I would say to those in elected offices, you need to take a very good look at police reform. Now, one thing you cannot do is reform a white supremacist mind. So if they find those kind of mindsets among law enforcement, then those are bad apples that need to be weeded out of these departments right away. In the city of Oakland, when Johannes Mezzeli's attorney sought to move the trial from Alameda County to another county, he raised an argument. And his argument was that Oakland has a historical problem because it recruited former Klansmen and Southerners out of the South into the city of Oakland to become police officers. And when they arrived in Oakland, they came with the same white supremacist mindset that many of them left the South with. So they become very abusive. It reminds me of that movie Training Day, where the rookie cop gets in the car with the, the veteran. Denzel. And the veteran tells them right away, forget what they told you at the academy. This is how things really work. Well, the culture of policing has a DNA. Police work in America finds its beginning in Virginia, and police officers at that time were posses that armed and organized themselves to put down slave rebellions. That's the DNA of police work. Now, we have to reform it, but those that have white supremacist mindsets cannot be reformed. They got to be gotten rid of. Then, those that are of right mind have to now reorganize how police work operates across these cities. And unless and until we're willing to accept that that has been the mindset and abolish it. So it's not about the rhetoric of the people who are responding to injustice. It's really about the rhetoric of the white supremacists that are guiding these police departments. So if they want to address rhetoric, you're looking now, they had come out of LAPD a group of cops that were celebrating the death of Mike Brown. They're singing songs over the death of Mike Brown. Well, Mike Brown got family. And even if we have not known him personally, we are him. That's why in Oakland we said, I am Oscar Grant. And in Ferguson they said, I am Mike Brown. And in New York they're calling the names. And in the cities across America they're calling the names of those that have been lost. Because as the Bible says, were it not for the grace of God, there go I. So there's nothing that separates me from Oscar. Not our faith, not our age, not our neighborhood. I am Oscar Grant. And we are standing in truth demanding justice. Thank you so much, Minister Mohammed, for coming in and talking to us. And I want KPFA to keep up the good work and all the listeners do what you've been asked to do. Because if we don't have a free voice, then we won't have a voice at all. So make sure you support KPFA Radio. That was Keith Mohammed from the Nation of Islam. Powerful stuff there. So let's take a short break. This is 
Rebel D. Back to the days of freedom fighters. Back to the days of the Panthers. What's up, y'all? This is Rebel Diaz, BlockReportRadio.com. Big ups to First Voice. We coming at you live for Oscar Grant. Come on, say, say come on, yeah. yeah. Come on, let me hear y'all say Oscar Grant. Oscar Grant. Say Joe Oscar Grant. Say Oscar Grant. I say free the land. Say free the come land. On, say free the land. Here we oh, go. Free the land. Hey, yo, these fake old cops better get ready for war. I heard you got yourself a gun. I got machetes and swords. I move siempre pa'lante like the soul of young lords. The only way I break the laws if I break a cop's jaw and raw. So F that, we sick of running around. That's for on July 4th, the flag's upside down. And I ain't even false flagging, man. I'll bang for liberation. Imagine if the Bloods and Crips was one nation. Imagine if the kings and folks got, got together and used that business hustler to make some real cheddar. Imagine if we all held the hood down together. Nobody disrespected, but believe we protected. Nobody getting robbed, nobody lose their necklace. Helping all the grandmas carry groceries, man. Let's believe we gon' do like we supposed to, man. Cause I'm ready for war, ready for more, ready for what? Huh? Ready for war, ready for more, ready for what? Yo, we ready for this life and world that I've been dreaming of. Fight your wars to go ahead and draft me. I got lookouts on the block, you can try and catch me, why the hell I even wanna go killing the rack? They ain't never done nothing to the brown and black. Matter of fact, man, I fight the war at home with automatic rifles. Every hood's a war zone, and the cops know that it's about to be on. They bring the war to the streets, cause you know the Bill of Rights gives us the right to hold heat. They put a 90 on your chest like you the punky QB. You don't wanna see me fatigued up, timed up, Zapatista covered up, huh? Ready for war, ready for more, ready for what, huh? Ready for war, ready for more, ready for what, yeah? Welcome back. To Full Circle, I'm your host, Felicia Bridges. We've just heard the song about Oscar Grant by Rebel D. That song definitely can fire you up to take action. We will now hear from Councilwoman Lynette Gibson Malcolhaney, who talks about how to effectively take action against injustice and what she is doing on the city council to bring the Oakland community together. So tell us what brought you out here, what your thoughts about on this day, on the anniversary of the death of Oscar Grant. First of all, we stand with those who are bereaved. My faith tradition, I'm a Christian, and we believe that we mourn with those who are mourned. And when uh, Reverend Wanda asked me to come, I was so incredibly honored to come and stand with this mother who has turned this tragedy into a, a cry for increased justice so that no other mother will ever have to know this pain. And that we will stand, I, I think, really as a reminder that we have so much more work to do. The Black Lives Matter movement is in full for force right now, and I'm uh, I'm very, very ecstatic about 2015. I was looking on the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement's website, and they were saying that uh, 2015 through the 24th is the year for people of African descent, which I think is very um, insightful with the times. It kind of links up where people of uh, African descent are uh, trying to gather the respect that should have been given um, at birth and this vigil is symbolic of that I feel I think you're right the quest for human dignity right is really universal it finds its its expression in this country having been rooted in the gross injustice tied to slavery I know there are many people in the current movement that are like we're not the new civil rights movement right but for me it's like this is liberation struggles yeah. right that started when the first group of people were taken by force from their quiet peaceable lives in the shores of africa right like there is always a need for us to affirm humanity and to to not get caught up in um trying to parse that down like you know so the year of the african it's the century of justice and that's i mean for, for me for me and i think other people are, are gathering it around but when we look at why why is the liberty of people with melanin in their skin right such a threat to people who don't i feel like black lives matter is a rallying cry for now because for too long we have become too complacent with the status quo we had started thinking that you know it was the criminals that were being subject to this and but it was the same thing for Ida B. Wells when they were fighting lynching right when when people could be lynched at random and there was vigilante justice and there were extra ju judicial uh, executions of people of black descent and even for Ida when you read her autobiography she says 
she found herself, she's a journalist, right? She's saying, you know, well, what did this man do? What did that brother do to be hung until you realize that it, there was nothing except being born black and being subject to this kind of terrorism? And our young people now are feeling that. Am I safe on the street from another somebody with a gun who is unregulated, who is unchecked, or from a police officer who would randomly choose me. It's a similar kind of tyranny that we have to fight again, and I'm reminded of Coretta Scott King's message to all of us that freedom is bought and paid for in every generation. Don't think it's a one-time purchase, right? We, we have to continually stay vigilant on uh, being a government by and for the people that protects the people. Was that one of the reasons why you ran for office and decided to become a city council person? Would you believe in the electoral process? I talk to a lot of young people, and sometimes it seems like they think that it doesn't matter who to vote for or their lost trust in the government and in their leaders. So can you talk about why you ran and what difference that you think you can make? I really ran because um, I feel like the young people, having been politicized on the campus of UC Berkeley dealing with the injustices that were going on in South Africa, we were rallying in the 80s because... Black men and women were like randomly being hung and disappeared in South Africa and we had a rallying cry for that human call. And I got involved in that political movement only to be discouraged as many of the young people who got involved in the Obama election only to be discouraged. But then we are reminded of what Frederick Douglass says, right? Power conceives nothing without a demand. Yeah. How silly of us and naive of us to think at some point they will become proper and polite to give you what you, what you need and that you demand. We have elders who told us that's not going to happen. So you have to continually replenish yourselves. And we have to know that the instruments, whether it's the media that's on, the corporate owned media, that people who are advantaged by the current system are not likely to give you a platform to talk about how you disrupt the system, right? So it is by design that we get discouraged. It is by design that we, you know, um, people are discouraged from participation. There's been an unwarranted attack on my character now. And I think it's not just about me. It's about discouraging anybody who has a conscientiousness from thinking that they could step up again into these seats of power. I ran because... Quite honestly, my pastor said, if those who can won't, what hope is there for community? True. It, he just called me out, right? Like, you know, don't don't be a coward and sit in your living room and think that things are going to get better for your child or my child or anybody's child. So this is um, a sacrifice. It's a labor of love. And there needs to be other people, right? So I can pass this torch and we can have, this is a distance race. No one person is going to take us across the finish line. We need to be able to hand the baton off. I see my esteemed brother here with us at the table, John Burris, you know, who's been a freedom fighter for a long time. But we have to have more young people engaged and involved and more of us who will engage in this from a place of, of love and to demand justice and to do that in a way that you don't become bitter, um, and and discouraged so yeah there's a new mayor in oakland right libby Schaff, do you feel that she is someone that you can work with and that will uh, make a change a positive change for people of color in oakland or do you think that she's more of the jerry brown sort of uh, more status quo democratic party so, right so let me say I, I really like libby and i've enjoyed working with her for the past two years but we we have to move beyond the politic of personality right it, it really doesn't matter who's elected if they were your enemy when they got elected or not. Once they are elected, they represent the people. And you have a right to petition your government for redress for the things that are wrong. You have an obligation to your society to serve on the jury, to, to get involved in this democracy, and to stand up for what is right. I, I would tell you one of the most um, enlightening moments over the past two years was for me to see the council chambers packed and our emails flooded with people who wanted to stand up to ensure justice for the Asian elephant that travels with the circus. <laughs> and this was a serious justice movement. And I, and I would tell you, it was so surreal because this is in the time when nationally, those of us who feel close to it, Mike Brown is the same age as my son. When I saw the video that was sent to me, that my, actually I think my son showed it to me before it was even hitting the news, the young people on social media had it, and I watched this baby lie in the street, and I watched his young friends traumatized in that moment and 
I'm sitting there feeling that, and we've been grieving since August. What is the status of justice going to be? What's going to happen in Ferguson? And then there are the rallies and the cries. And I'm sitting in the council chambers, in the people's chambers, and I had people quoting Frederick Douglass and Dr. King in defense of the elephant. In defense wow. of the elephant. And it was... And, and I love animals, right? And I want justice for the elephant. I'm not making light of the seriousness when they're saying, you know, elephants performing in the traveling circus are just like slaves. They are forced bondage labor. And I'm sitting up here like these people didn't even understand how offensive that was to me as a black woman. They had no clue. So they were being impassionate about what they cared about. And I'm sitting there while I'm still grieving. Because I don't know what's happening in Ferguson. I know friends that are down there on the street. I have journalists from here that I know that I went to undergrad with who are being tear gassed. And I'm getting live stream reports. And when we start to talk about Black Lives Matter, there's one woman who comes to every council meeting. And she gets two minutes on the mic. Mr. Sada, shout out to you who will come and say, I want you to remember the black boys in this community. I want you to remember that we have kids that are suffering post-traumatic stress syndrome in this community. I want you to remember that there are hungry people in this community. But the urgency for the elephant was what was commanding our time and our attention in that chambers. Long story to get to this very short answer. We need those people who believe in the sanctity of life for their communities, where you're African-American, a Muslim-American, who you are, you, you've you got to make this government respond to you, and you have to show up and to demand to be heard in the chambers that you pay for, right? There is there is a um, very important part of street protest. It is an important part of the struggle, but it is only one tool, right? And you can't play that, ho you can't build a house with just a hammer, right? You've got to have many tools in your toolbox in order to build this house of justice. And I'm really encouraging people to use the other tool, which includes emailing the mayor and the council members to say we want the city of Oakland to reflect in its values and in its budget a care and concern for the human lives that are entrusted to our care. That's beautiful. Yeah. I, I hope for that for 2015. And thank you so much, Lynette Gibson, Malcolm Haney from the Oakland City Council to talk with us this afternoon. Thank you both. Peace. That was Councilwoman Malcolm Haney. At the end of that interview, Councilwoman Malcolm Haney invited the Oakland community to a special meeting of the Oakland City Council on the subject of black lives. This special session of the Oakland City Council will be held on Saturday, January 24th. You can contact the entire Oakland City Council by emailing citycouncil at Oakland. Net. With so much to plan and think about, let's take another musical break. Here's a song by Bell's Atlas.
Atlas Capable People by Bell's Atlas. Next, we will hear Oscar Grant's Uncle Bobby, Cephas Johnson, talk about his long-range vision of how youth will be the new leaders of the civil rights movement. What do you see about the movement for justice, the movement for police accountability happening across the country and here in Oakland? What are your thoughts about that? Well, you know, I I continue to uh, maintain faith. The most important aspect of this movement is to get accountability. And it behooves us as a society uh, to begin to hold officers accountable for the wrongs they commit. Our failure to do so creates an imbalance in the human being. But not only an imbalance in the human being, but an imbalance in a community, in a society. And any time that imbalance is within a society or community, imbalanced things happen. So we cry all the time about, um, you know, those that are seem to be rioters, but they're not rioting. They're rebelling. You know, and there's an imbalance that has been created because of the injustice, the failure to be accountable or held accountable for the wrongs committed in the community. And so we see on a regular basis people acting in an imbalanced way. But yet it's a right, uh, a righteous way because we're expressing the pain of a system failing us to hold those that are perpetrating the wrong in the community accountable for that wrong. And when you see the death of Mike Brown and Eric Gardner, does that bring up feelings for you that are very difficult? Or, I mean, do you when you meet family members, how is that feeling between you all who share a really awful commonality? Well, you know, I always remember what the Oakland community did for us as a family, you know, by embracing us, loving us, praying with us, going back and forth to court with us, even crying with us. You know, this Oakland community that utilized their First Amendment right to speak to the injustice. And it was because of that that helped me understand that if I can give that to a family that have suffered the same wrong that we have, that traumatic experience of being uh, a family member murdered by those that we thought were serve and protect, uh, if I can give them what the community gave us, um, though it's painful, it's also healing. You know, it's, it, I do not want to go to my grave not standing up for what is right. Because my pain is just a microcosm of the pain that exists in this world. And so uh, part of the healing is sharing the hope in our experience with that family. It, it sounds as if you all are, uh, in addition to feeling this incredible pain, you also get to feel this amount of strength because you're seeing the community coming together and you're able to see that like together we can do some really amazing things. It happened over a terrible circumstance, but this is kind of allowed for people to coalesce and say, like, this needs to change. Like, this type of stuff can't happen anymore. And Minister uh, Muhammad was just saying that... Um, like, if not for the uh, people getting out into the streets and demanding justice, then the Oscars uh, killer Meserly wouldn't have gotten anything more than likely. And, and that is so correct. You know, uh, you know, our unity is more powerful than an atomic bomb. So when we work together as a society, like we did here in Oakland, and working together in a unified manner, we were able, for the first time in California state history, we got to let that resonate. And hear what I'm saying. In the first time in California state history, an officer was arrested, charged, convicted, and even sent to jail. I mean, that is historical. We don't clap on it as a victory, but it is historical. Because as we look back over these last five years, you know, coming up on six years now, but these last five years, what have we seen? Many young black and brown men killed all over this country. And no officers being held accountable. You know, and a lot of that has to do in many ways our failure to unify our voice, a failure to unify our differences in belief, a failure to unify in how to make this happen. You know, when we go to the, the district attorney head and he says, I can't talk to but two of you because there's a thousand of you outside, them two should say, you, if you don't talk to all of us, you don't talk to none of us. And that's how unified we have to be. That's how important this unification is because that's the only way that we will bring about a change, staying unified. Um, so let me ask you about 2015 and where do you see the movement going? Is there any big campaigns that's happening that people can get engaged in? I certainly don't want to wait until someone I know personally, a loved one, gets harmed by the police. So if people are listening and want to get engaged and they, they want to do something, how can they plug into you? 
you know, everybody has a position to play. And if your position is um, creating spoken word, conscious spoken word, to speak to the issue of terrorism by the police, do that. If your gift is uh, creative writing and uh, you need to express that, express it through uh, what God has given you, that gift. And uh, you can definitely be creative in um, sharing um, lyrics and words when it comes to police terrorism. Because it is really not even about us. It's not. This is not about me. This is about uh, our future generations. Really, we need to look at what we want 20 50 to look like because if we can see what 2050 can look like then we can backtrack to how to get to that point and of course uh, we all have a part to play in that and these children that i speak to and if there's young people that are listening to my voice right now it is about you and your babies if you think that you have it bad now and you fail to stand up in your responsibility to make a better world for your babies. You don't want to be like us having another visual speaking about how to make a change. This change starts with each one of us today to work for that ultimate goal or 2050 or whatever the goal is that you short, you see. There should be short-term goals, mid-term goals, and long-term goals. My ultimate goal that I would love to see is that no more black and brown babies dying in the street unjustifiably. Every police officer that commits a wrong is held accountable. We can get there, but it takes work on, it takes work on each of our part. Excellent. Those are some really, really concrete tools that can be used. We've been asking people about what they think about the personal recording devices and the body cameras. Do you have a comment about what do you think that is an important part, a solution? If an officer is engaged in a youth and he does not turn his camera on, there's no ifs and reasons about it. He must be uh, held accountable for that. That means termination. However, because of our technology, if we could put instruments on Mars. We can definitely set it up to where uh, a police officer wearing a camera can open his door and it automatically turns on. So there's no excuses for why a camera can't work. But we got to remember this, just because a camera works and it does turn on, we still got to hold the criminal justice system accountable. And because of white supremacy and how we all been affected by it, we have a tendency a tendency to seem to rule in favor of the police officer, even though there's clear evidence showing the wrong. In many cases, like in our case, judges will overturn a verdict that came from the jury. You hear what I'm saying? Okay. They do this on a regular, consistent basis when it comes to police officers. This is historical. I'm only talking facts. You can look this up. Why do they have to overturn a guilty verdict from a jury when, in essence, the jury is supposed to be the ultimate uh, decision maker on the officer being guilty or not? So we have a system, a criminal justice system that is broken from the very foundation. And so it's going to take, of course, uh, much rebuilding and molding, but it starts with our babies. If I can give a solution to that, that ultimate goal 2050 is right now dealing with our babies. Uh, changing them within their heart, first to love one another, but also to understand the essence of love among us as a people. And it's that generation that grows up that can change the real culture of a, a, a of a system that we know that is by its very foundation wasn't built for us as a people, specifically black people, but I can say generally too for black, brown, Asians, and poor whites. You know, Frederick Douglass quote is one of my favorite quotes, and it is it says that it is easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. So today, our work is really for our babies, you know, and so that educational aspect, of course, teaching us about our history, our children about their history, uh, will build strong children to have within their core, I mean, I'm talking about in their deep core, a love for people, because you must first love yourself in order to love others that don't look like you. And so it's that core that has to be built within all of us, our children specifically, that would change the whole paradigm of what we see today happening across this country.
That was the voice of Cephas Johnson, otherwise known as Uncle Bobby, and he is here at the sixth year anniversary of the murder of Oscar Grant here at the Fruitvale BART station. And we heard, the, before we wrap up, we heard the minister talk about the DNA of the police force in this country and how it is founded on white supremacy and on slave catching. So given that fact, how, how do you see an ability of systemic change being brought by the people to the police? Do you see a way to do that? I, I consistently talk about the children because the route to fixing this starts with them. Um, you know, we have a system. Uh, it's very DNA nature that the minister spoke about, and I didn't hear what he said, but I'm assuming that um, the very essence of what's in this culture of the criminal justice system that radiates through the frontline soldier, that police officer, is so filled with white supremacy. That's what he said. Exactly. It, oh, wow. See, <laughs> that's just a confirmation of what we realize is what's going on. This society and white supremacy has to be dressed at its very core. And so as long as that exists, I don't care what kind of changes we make, white supremacy will prevail in the essence of the act perpetrated on people of color, which will be harmful. And so we have to really, really from uh, 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 a new generation bring in a whole new understanding and eradicate white supremacy from this earth. You hear what I'm saying? From this earth. Because we know capitalism is one aspect, but imperialism is like a, a, a parasite. It lands on you and sucks the blood up out of wherever it lands, out of its host. And so we have white supremacy, the way I see it, as a parasite all around the world, sucking the blood out of people that are just trying to um, live their lives. Uncle Bobby has worked tirelessly to make people aware of what they can do to address the injustices that happen every day. He is passing the torch to the youth who are the vehicles to make a better future. I talked to the youth in attendance about why they were at the rally, their hopes and their dreams of the future. I was charged by the depth of their awareness about the disparities that exist and I was thrilled to be talking with them. So why are you here? I came with my brother to um, just to see how like a demonstration is. Like, so. Do you know about Oscar Grant? Uh, yes. Tell me about it. Did you know? That he was on the bar and then that there was like some kind of disruption. And so the police pulled him, him and his friends off the bar. He, they handcuffed him, and when he was on the ground, the police stated that he um, pulled out his taser, but actually pulled out his gun and shot him in the back. So if you had a dream of the future, what would it look like? That everybody was looked at equally. My name is Mohammed Kafani Bey, and I'm 13 years old. You're a pay child. Okay. Yeah. Um, you're 13. Yeah. So why are you here? We're just here to... Uh, mourn over the death of Oscar Grant and also for the other deaths that's been going on like Eric Gardner, Tamir Rice, Antonio Martin, Mike Brown especially. So yeah, we're just coming together on the day to make some type of piece of it. So yeah. And what do you hope to accomplish today? I want to see just a, a lot more people just so like we can help his mom to like know that we actually care and that like his life does matter. And you're in school, right? Yeah, I'm the I'm my class president. Oh wow, yeah. you're a class president of Dallas Ranch. Okay. Should we be educating our kids with today? What message do you have for educators? Well, I think one of the main problems is racial profiling and that should be one of the main things that like concern me. So yeah. And when I see you ten years down down the road in the future, what will you be doing? I'll be the leader of these, hopefully. Leader of the people? Yeah, leader of the people. All right. My name is Jafar Kalfani Bey. Yes, my little brother. Oh, that's your little brother. Okay. Why are you here today? Uh, we're, I'm here to commemorate Oscar Grant and also hopefully talk about all the things that have been going on around uh, the world right now 
and all the 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 um, wrongful deaths of a lot of uh, young black and um, any race of kids that have been killed. I hope that it accomplishes to let people know what's going on because a lot of people don't know and therefore they can't make a difference if they don't know. Right. And if I look at you 10 years down in the future, what would I see? A lawyer, an attorney. I'm Matthew Gray, and I'm 17 years old. Matthew, why are you here today? I'm here to see my girlfriend. Familiar about what's going on with this event? Not exactly, but I have an idea. Do you know about the Oscar Grant story? I do. What do you know? That he was shot. That he was shot. And what else do you know about it? A lot of people are upset. Uh, with the way it, it's a police brutality case, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What do you think an event like this would accomplish? It definitely shows that there is an issue in our society today, and how police can handle situations, and that there are that there is a need for some sort of resolution when it comes to these things. How do you think education should respond to the death of young people, particularly boys of color? Well, it is a tragedy that these things do happen. I don't think that they should be ignored. I definitely do think that people should look at these and try to learn from something. Maybe change the way they see other things. And when you look at the future 10 years down the line, what do you see yourself doing? I'm not sure exactly. I'm almost a college student. Right. I've got my whole life ahead of me. So what do you, do you just go without a plan? What do you want to do? Ten years from now, what does it look for you? Maybe I'll start a family. Maybe I'll have a career. <laughs> and how would you like the world to be? Well, I've heard that the world is actually a lot safer now than it is than it has been in the past. But if we can continue to make it safer for not only, well, just for everybody, really, that's what I want to see. Victor McElhaney. Um, I'm 17, sorry. <laughs> so why are you here? Came out here. Uh, my mother's a city council person. I'm hanging out with her today. Um, yeah, so she you know, she gave her speech about Oscar Grant and everything. So what do you think about this event? Uh, I think it's very beautiful. I think it's really, really powerful to see community out, you know? What do you know about Oscar Grant? Not very much. I was very young when uh, he passed. I think I was like 11, like 10 or 11. So, yeah, and like my personal research into the events haven't been extensive. What I do know, though, is that he was handcuffed when he was shot and that he was detained and that he was laying on his stomach. That's what I know for certain. So, you know, that's uh, just that by itself just shows a lot of injustice, you know, like because he was already taken. He was already held. He was captured. He was not a threat, definitely not a lethal threat. Him dying the way he did being in cuffs, being in police custody, being arrested and dying. It's like, how obvious it, does it have to be, you know? I mean, as far as this event, Oscar Grant's death, I feel like, was an injustice that can't ever be completely made up for. But at the same time, the officer has already been tried and he already served the time that he did. Though I don't feel like it was justly handled, that has happened. So I feel like this event at this point serves two purposes. It serves a purpose of reminding the community of the injustices that go, that happen when we are negligent and when we don't voice ourselves. And then also it works as a way to continue to voice our distraught and distrust of the current system. And if I were to see you 10 years from now, what would you be doing? Probably playing music somewhere. Okay, you're a musician. Yes. Right? What do you play? I play drums. So okay. Uh, yeah. All right. And my last question, mm -hmm. I said the first, first, the other one was my last, but this would be my last. Mm -hmm. How do you think education should respond to the death of, of young men? Honestly, I'm tired of learning from the white supremacist viewpoint. It's just, it's very annoying to me. I feel like I, in order to really have like any type of real understanding or full perspective of what this country is, like I have to do so much research by myself. And I feel like what's taught in school isn't an accurate representation of this country. The minister just said that, you know, this country is, is, a, is a land of immigrants. And I mean, 
I don't know. I don't. I don't really like to say that because I don't feel like everyone's here voluntarily. You know, immigration feels always. You know, but you know, it's mass immigration um, all around, and so learning things from like the Euro perspective is very narrowing to how the world actually is, how this country was actually built. You know, like I don't know. What's an example when they tell you in. In history class, something like uh, the Declaration of Independence, like, freed the slaves, and they make it that simple. And then, you know, I go and read about it. Uh, he didn't really free the slaves. He freed all the slaves in all the states that rebelled, so nobody was freed. And all the, like, you know, states that were iffy that had slaves, he just kind of left out of the Declaration. So, you know, it's like stuff like that like that really show you the entirety and the full complexity of this country and like you know the different things marshawn jones i'm 16 well i think it's i think it's great what they're doing for oscar like it's a lot of support out here to help him and stuff so i think it's just fine like i don't know they the family about with oscar and great and them i think they went through a lot of suffering and i think they need help and it ain't no help to nobody to help them so what do you what do you expect this event to accomplish? I think I think it's accomplishing like just awareness, like to help black people be aware of, of what's happening in this world and all the bad stuff that's happening. Like I don't know how to explain it, but it's a lot of stuff that's happening. How do you see education responding to the loss of young life of color? Education is the way out. That's how I see it. Like, it's the way out of the ghetto or wherever you are. It's just, it's just an opportunity for, for being better than what you, what you were. So, but how should school respond to historically the events that are happening, like the death of Oscar Grant, the loss of Ahmaud Arbery, the death of Ahmaud Arbery, the death of all these young boys who are innocent, unarmed? They should talk about that more because they don't even talk about it at all in school. Two years from now, what kind of world will it be and what will you be doing? Ten years from now, I'll probably be looking for a job or some some to benefit me. Do something to benefit. So what, are you, what, what, what do you like doing? I like playing sports and stuff. Basketball, football. Just, I don't know. I just do hobbies, just anything to take my mind off of what's really happening. And with that, how would you like the world to be? I like it to I like it to be nicer, but it don't seem like that's gonna happen. Like you the world is what you make it really. So I'll just leave you with that. <laughs> If you would like to hear extended youth voices of the Oscar Grant Rally, then tune in tomorrow at noon on KPFB 89.3. Talk to teacher at 12 o'clock where I will be featuring more voices of the Oakland youth from the Oscar Grant Rally on New Year's Day. Well, that brings us to the end of tonight's show. Tune in next week to Full Circle at 7 p.m. right here at 94.1 FM KPFA. And we want new apprentices. We want to be sure to let our listeners know that the apprenticeship program is now looking for group 41 Yay! to apply go to kpfaapprentice.org and download an application or come into the station at 1929 martin luther king jr way in berkeley or call us at 510-848-6767 extension 235 we can mail you an application the application deadline is february 27 2015 at 5 p.m special Thanks to our production team at the rally, Miss M, Junior Jackson, Vilma V, Free Will and Franklin, Sarah Blanco, Eve Argetti, and myself, Felicia Bridges. For extended interviews of our guests this evening, go to the Full Circle website at kpfaapprentice.org. Also tune in tomorrow at 12 o'clock for more youth voices from the rally on my show, Talk to Teacher, KPFB, 89.3 FM in Berkeley. Our executive producer is bringing us a much needed jolt of knowledge, clarity, humor. Here comes Richard Wolf to clarify with that cunning sardonic touch our economic and political dilemmas. 
Cornel West calls Wolf the leading social economist in the country. Noam Chomsky says Wolf's innovative ideas suggest new and promising ideas for authentic democracy. Wolf's topic, time to change this capitalist system. Oh, yes, we can. Sunday evening, February 15th, he will be at First Congregational Church, 2345 Channing Way in Berkeley. There's wheelchair access at this KPFA benefit. Sasha Lilly of Against the Grain will host advanced tickets available at brownpapertickets.com and supportive bookstores. Bless them. More info on the KPFA website for Sunday, February 15th, 7.30 p.m., Richard Wolf.